Okay, good morning everyone. We are so glad that you can join us today. And this is a special day. It's a special day because this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in Him. But today is also special because it is Father's Day. And what I have done is put together a wonderful package for you. And you know we are doing this series on prayer. So I thought it was very, very appropriate to just look at the first verse of our Lord's Prayer. Well, I say Lord's Prayer, but I'll explain that in a little bit. And uh, we're going to talk about our Father today. But today we want to also enjoy worship, enjoy something from our younger ones, and uh, then we will have the Word of God. Let us pray as we start our service today. Father and our God, we thank you that we can come into your presence. And we thank you for this very special day. And as it, as it is a significant day, I pray that, Lord, you will continue to bless our fathers in our country, around the world, in our churches. And I pray, Father, as this service is geared towards showing the importance of fatherhood, that you will use everything that will be said and done in this service to bring honor and glory to your name. Bless our time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
My dad's name is Said Muhammad. He makes new nicknames for me every month. And they are all funny. My favorite memory is when he took me to the water park. My dad's name is Said Muhammad. And one of the funniest things my dad ever said to me was to spell Staphylophagos. And one of the most memorable, time, memorable times that I have ever had with, with him is a time when my grandparents were upstairs with my mother and my sister and me and him went to buy fireworks without any of them knowing and we bought a lot without them knowing and, uh, and when we came back home it was just really fun. When we went to Ovando and went, and went to the hotel Westgate and it was very, it was so much fun. Happy Father's Day. Hi guys, my name is Aidan and my dad's name is Kudgor. I love him because he is very generous and he always helps me with my work. Our favorite memory together is when we went on a roller on a big roller coaster at Universal Studios. And happy Father's Day, Dad. My daddy's name is Robert Freddy Bacon. And after he tell a story, he, he always say, Frick, crack, monkey, drake, and back. He's a puma rat. Dead puma rat. My memory is playing spider with my daddy. My daddy does make a spider. He puts his hand and walks it like a spider. And I does kill it. Bye. What is your dad's name? Sanel Baburam. And what is the funniest joke your dad ever told you? It goes like this. A madman was pulling a string and the doctor asked him, Well, why are you pulling the strings for? And the madman said, Well, if you're so good, then you push it now. <laughs> Catch that one. And what is the best memory you ever had with your dad? Well... Um, when I fell down, he he take he took very well care of me. He put it up. He put a plaster. Okay, that's very nice. Thank you. What is your daddy's name? Sino. And you find your fa daddy funny? Yeah. What funny things your daddy do? He wears your face and bite bite your butt nose. My daddy's name is. Ariel Boudram. He is the funniest dad that I ever had. Where's my dad? Trying to funny his jokes in the whole world. Okay. Why? Six hundred to know. Why seven eight nine? Why? Because seven was hungry. <laughs> I love my daddy because he was the first person to hold me when I was a little baby. We like to watch documentaries together we, and we are always hugging and kissing each other. My daddy's name is Carlos James. I love my daddy because he taught me to ride my bike without training wheels. He works very hard and he's always hugging and tickling me. 
and he always answers all of my questions. I would like to take this opportunity to wish all the fathers of Mono Road Evangelical Bible Church. Happy Father's Day. May you continue to be strong, helpful, spiritful, and may God richly bless you.
So as we move into our message at this point in time, after a wonderful time in worship, as I introduced earlier, the theme for our message today is our Father. And that title is taken from what we usually call the Lord's Prayer. But today I want to teach you and inform you that this is not necessarily the Lord's Prayer as we may think of it. But it is a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And so I want to look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, where the Bible says in verse 9, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That is all I will read for, read today. And I will want to share with you on that verse and that two words, our Father. And you know, my dear friends, a lot of time the question is asked, which person in the Godhead should we address our prayer to? Which person in the Godhead should we address our prayer to? And I want to share with you, before I get into the meat of the message today, we should approach different members of the Godhead differently. Now, it is a good place to remind you that each member of the Godhead is a person. So if you have the habit of referring to the Holy Spirit as an it, don't do that. He is a person, and I will explain that as we go along. So I thought it was very appropriate this morning, just before we get into this message, to take a couple of minutes and address this whole issue of which person in the Godhead should we, should we address our prayer to. The first person is to the Father. To the Father. Our Heavenly Father lives in heaven. There is none like unto him. He is the Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. The Jehovah Rapha, God is our healer, and so on and so forth. The compound names of God. We approach God and pray to him. He is the majestic, the powerful, the awesome, perfect God. And Jesus taught us that we must approach our Father. But it's also important to note that when we pray, it is through the Son. Through the Son. And you know, we read in that one verse, Hallowed be thy name. And his name is to be revered, adored, worship. And worship is the way you think and treat someone that you admire. So I want to make it abundantly clear to you, and this will be very important for the message itself, that this God is to be worship. But when we come to God, it is through the person of Jesus. Through the person of Jesus. So when we say we are praying in Jesus' name, or we finish the prayer and we say in the name of Jesus, that is not just an addendum to your prayer. What it is, is we are praying to the Father through the one who we have access to and who died on the cross to set us free. Let me share with you a couple of scriptures. The first one is Hebrews 7.25. Here's what the scripture says. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always live, lives to intercede for them. So I am saying to you, yes, there are times that we can approach the Son. Because you see, it will be theologically right to say, thank you, Lord, as part of our prayer, for saving me. It would not be right to tell the Father, Father, thank you for dying for me. The Father didn't die for you. The Son did. Another verse of scripture, 1 Timothy 2.5. 
For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. So I'm going to repeat again, when we pray in the name of Jesus, it means that I'm going to the Father, but I have the backing of the name of Jesus. That name uh, represents the authority that Jesus gives to me because he died for, for me. He set me free. He delivered me. So therefore, when I pray in that name, it's not, it's not just in Jesus' name at the end. No, I pray with the backing of Jesus who did all he has done for me. And then another point that is so important, we pray, we pray by the Spirit. And I say by the Spirit because the Spirit of God has specific function. One of the functions, for example, he convicts us of sin. Or he illuminates our mind. In other words, when I am preparing a message, when I am preaching, I will always, when I'm in difficulty, because far above and beyond human uh, uh, theologians and great men of God, is the fact that you want the Holy Spirit to direct your path and the very words. And he, I depend on him, I pray to him, I ask him to reveal to me, to reveal to me what specifically and accurately the God wants the people to know as I preach God's word. Look at the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 10 to 13. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The Bible says the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Take note of that. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but that the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Listen to this now, verse 13. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. And so, my dear friends, I want you to understand very clearly that we pray to, the God, to God, to the Father, through the Son, and by the Spirit. You might say, Pastor Mike, could you show me a verse that encompasses that? I'm so glad that you asked. And I always have a verse ready for you. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18. The Bible says, For through him, are you seeing that there? We both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Now, just in the event that you make a mistake and you say, God, Father, thank you for dying for me. That's not theologically right. But I don't think God, in all his wisdom, will look down on you and say, look at this pitiful one. He doesn't even know that Jesus died for his sins. So we may fumble a little bit here and there, and God, the Father and the Son, has a they have a beautiful relationship so that, you know, I believe there will be no offense. However, it is right, as Jesus taught us from the Scripture, to pray in this certain pattern. And he himself, on the face of the earth, says, our Father. Now we have gotten that out of the way. I want to get into the meat of the message because I took a few minutes to deal with that because, you know, I like to deal with issues. And it's a question that is often asked. And so I want to, at this juncture, get into the message today. And I want to talk about our Father and three areas of connection to our Father. Three areas of connection to our Father. You know, when Jesus was on the face of the earth, we saw a beautiful relationship with God and His Son. God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So much so that the approach was 
our Father. And the first area of connection I want to speak on this wonderful Father's Day. And as I spend time talking on these points, there are three hours that I will talk on. I want to tell you it's going to be a two-way street. We're going to talk about the Father and we're going to talk about the Son. We're going to talk about the beautiful example with God the Father and God the Son. But in the same breath, I am also going to talk about uh, our earthly father and his relationship to his child or children as the case may be. So today, I want to deal with the first point and that is going to talk or we're going to deal now with respect. Respect. And the first thing I want you to understand when he says our father, the very first word is our father, he's talking about a family. A family. Immediately, we think about a connection with a father and a son, or father and his children. We are special children in the sight of God. And I want to make it clear when he talks about all of our father, we are not talking about blue-eyed boys or spoiled brats. No, no, no. I am talking about his children that make up the body of Christ, of which he is the head, and he may gift some with special abilities to do things for the kingdom of God. He might bless one to be a preacher. He might bless one to be a singer, a worship leader, a usher, a whatever it is. But no one is more important than the other. Let's get that very, very clear. And that is a very significant point because even in our earthly relationship with our children, there could be the tendency to favor one over the other. And that is not God's intention. And when he says, our father, he is making the point that, listen, we have a family. But what should happen in this family? The first point that I am elaborating today is respect respect. My dear friends, as we talk about respect, we look at Jesus who says to his father, our father, and he made the point, hallowed be thy name. That word hallowed is an old English word that means separate, sacred, and set apart. And I'll probably talk a little more about that in the next message. But what I want to share with you, there was so much adoration and reverential fear and respect for his heavenly father. And that is what I want you to know. Now, we ought to worship our heavenly father. And as I make the application to fathers or human fathers, or earthly fathers, I am a father, and I don't want my children to worship me. The only person they have to do is worship God. But what the scripture clearly says, and I'm going to read it for you now, is that we need to respect our fathers. And let me tell you today's Father's Day, and one of the best things that you can do in forming that connection with your dad is show respect to him. Let us look at what the scripture says. And when I read the scripture, from Ephesians, you will see it's a two-way street. You have to respect your father, and at this, in the same breath, that father, to his father, say, fathers, let me speak to you. You also have to respect your children. Let's see what the scripture says. Ephesians chapter 6, from verses 1 to 4. The Bible says, children, children, yes, to this father's day, children, you listen, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Listen to what it says, verse 2. Honor your father and your mother. Honor your father and your mother. Which is the first commandment with a promise. So that it may go well with you. And that you may enjoy long life. Long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. And that simply means to irritate and frustrate your children intensely. 
And we'll talk about that in a minute. But fathers, do not exasperate your children. You see, that's the rule of the father now. Instead, bring them up. Listen to me, fathers. Bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. What I want to say today is the scripture is making it clear that respect has to be shown in the home. We live in a day and an age when respect or honor given to your father or your parents is a lost art in society. I hear with my own ears. Well, I can't hear with anybody else, else's ear. So I'm just emphasizing the point. I have heard personally, my dear friends, that you have a father giving instruction to his child for the child's well-being, own good. Who to date, who not to date, who to, you know, uh, good instructions. And all that child could do in return is argue back, back answer, because they don't even take note of the importance of proper instructions. And in the same breath, honoring their parents. The scripture is very clear. Children, obey your parents. Obey your parents. Honor your father and your mother. In God's kingdom and in your home, if you say you have a Christian home, there's no room for spoiled brats where you have children speaking to parents how they want. Come on, we have to do better than that. You know, the saying is, there was a time long ago when the father spoke to the child. The child trembled. Now, when the children speak, the fathers tremble. I, I don't know about that. What I'm telling you here is what the scripture is saying. Is that, uh, that we need to remember children. Let's remember who they are. What they have done for you. Take care of them even in their old age. Have you seen when fathers get a little older in life, and I, I appreciate and I trust that some of you seniors will appreciate what I am saying. Children have no time for you. Yes, I know you have your own home. I know you have your own family. The scripture says, leave father and mother. But it also says you have to honor your parents. And I have seen children uh, actually put aside or cast aside their parents, and the scripture is totally against that. I am here to tell you this Father's Day. I don't care how old your, your parents are. Take time to honor them. Now, in that passage, it also tells us that fathers should not exasperate your children. And I give you the meaning while I was reading it, where it says, do not exasperate, meaning you should not irritate or frustrate your children intensely. You know, there are some cruel dads. There are some wicked fathers. And I trust that I'm not talking to any of you. And if you are like that, take the instructions from the scripture. And how, now some of you may do it intentionally. Some of you might be abusive to your wife and your children. God has something to say about that. Because in the scripture here, we, give a, we, we have a clear command that Fathers in particular, and today's Father's Day, have a responsibility, and listen to this very carefully, to be sensitive to their unique and emotional makeup, the children's unique and emotional makeup. You know, you have children, and there could be the tendency to paint a broad brush with all the children. You know, this happens a lot when children are writing SEA. You want your child to get the first choice. No, nothing is wrong with that. I, I, I am for ambition. But my God, you have 19,000 children writing SE. All of them will go to the prestigious schools? No. And sometimes you have to look at your children. I, 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 no, you want the best for your child. I'm not taking away that. But in the process, and I have seen parents go high and hell waters, do all kinds of things, just to make sure that their children, you know, go to one of these prestigious schools, but at what expense? I have also seen 
children by some string goes to that school and they can't cope with the work. What I am saying, you can exasperate your children. And I just give one example here. And, and as I said, you need to be sensitive to your children's unique and emotional makeup. Some children might just be slower than others. It is not to condone slackness and laziness and throw them aside. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if you are sensitive to each uh, child's need, it will help you in the process. So it is important to respect your fathers and your mother's children, but fathers, it is equally important for you to understand your children. I trust this has been helpful to you as I move to point number two. And the second point that I want to talk about is relationship. Relationship. Now I want to go back to my text again, or my title, Our Father. Our Father. What was happening here? Jesus Christ was referring to God the Father with all his heart and with a wonderful relationship saying, our father. Let me give you another theological lesson. The only time that Jesus referred to his father as God was on the cross. It was on the cross. And that is an important point that I want to come to. But all the other times, he was having a wonderful relationship with his father. And I'll get to that in a minute. But let me first of all tell you that do not start with your earthly father unless this earthly father, he reflects our heavenly father. You might say, oh, why are you saying that, Pastor Mike? Because you see, if you start with your earthly father, and just in the event, just in the event, he may have a lot of imperfections. He may even be abusive. There is the tendency to think of God just as how your earthly father is. But that is not the case. Don't put all your marbles on your biological father. But if that father, and this is my challenge to you this Father's Day, if this father... If this father could just live a life pleasing to God and reflect the principles and the power of God in his life, then by all means look at that man. And he's not God, but he's going to be like Paul who said, be followers of me as I am a follower of Christ. So as I said, my dear friends, do not start with your earthly father unless he reflects our heavenly father. But I also want to share with you, do not relate to him as a judge. I was just explaining to you a short while ago that the only time that Jesus referred to his heavenly father as God was on Calvary's cross. Because you see, at that time, he was now saying to God, you are my God, the judge of heaven and earth. And what was happening on the cross, our sins was placed on him. And therefore, at that point in time, it was not no child-father relationship as much as it was God being the judge. Let me give you an example. Suppose you have a father who works in the high court as a judge. Just say, for an example. And the father at home has a wonderful relationship with you. He plays with you, he spends time with you, he spends time with you, and all that kind of thing. And you commit a felony. You did something wrong. The police charges you, and you now have to go to court. And if it happens to be that same person 
who all the time you had a wonderful relationship with, is now sitting on the bench as a judge. He now cannot be your friend. He cannot have that relationship. And so I make that point to tell you that when Jesus was on the cross, God was the judge. And later on, post-resurrection, John chapter 20, verse 17, he told Mary the same thing. He says, your father is your God, and so is my father, God. But separate and apart from that, there was always a relationship with his heavenly father. And I want to share with you, until that day that you approach your, 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 your God as judge, because every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, when we have accepted him as personal Lord and Savior, he's our friend. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I don't want you to get confused with the first point. Yes, we have to pay respect to him. I believe that. Too often, we walk into the courts of heaven with muddy shoes and, and a lot of disrespect. But what I am saying here, secondly, is that he wants to have a relationship with you. So much so that in Romans chapter 8, he talks about uh, Abba Father. My dear friends, your daddy has a daddy. Your daddy has a daddy who should reflect Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about your earthly grandparents, your Aja, your Nana. I am talking about your heavenly father. So don't be a father only by title. You know, there are a lot of fathers who are around only to, because they provide a little something, they're around to eat. But there is no care, there is no um, sense of relationship with their children. And we like the title father, but do we also take time to have and to build relationship with our children. You know, the Bible talks about that. And what I want to say is that so often, so often, we can be so busy accumulating stuff that we don't have the wisdom or the common sense to manage our time where we can spend some quality time with our children. Let me take you to a couple of verses. I don't talk just like that. I like the scripture to speak to us. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 5 and 6, the Bible says, fools fold their hands. That means fools are lazy. They fold their hands. They do nothing. And ruin themselves. Verse 6, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. In other words, what the Bible is saying here is better to have less and enjoy rather than to have a lot and it is useless. Let me tell you about a father who was very ambitious and there is nothing wrong with ambition. But he goes to, to work and instead of working 40, 50 hours a week, he worked 70 hours a week. He was bringing in a good paycheck at the end of the week. But while he was so busy with doing all that, thank God for ambition, because the scripture just talked about lazy uh, fathers or lazy men. In fact, the Bible tells us you're worse than an infidel if you can't provide for your family. So I am saying provide for them. But the other side of that is that you could be so occupied and preoccupied with your business, with your job, with your career, that you neglect your children and your family. And this man in question, he, he did that. He went ahead and he um, just was working 70 hours a day. And then the time came when, well, by that time, what happened, his, he never had time for his wife, so he, his wife had a career. She didn't separate from him, but she had other interests now. 
um, she had a career. She started to, to work and spend more time with her job when her ideal would have been to spend time with her family or her husband when he comes home. So after he spent a lot of while, a long while, um, accumulating and accumulating, he was now more in his senior years. He comes home because now, because he had put in so much effort, he was given the highest position in his company. And he come home ready to boast to his children, and he's proud. But you know, distinctly on that day, his wife was at work, his children had grown up and gone, and he had nobody to enjoy his newfound position and status with. What a sad state of affairs. My dear friends, I want you to take time, and fathers, take time to enjoy your family. We mightn't always do it right, you know. You know, I, a couple days ago, we celebrated Jeremy's birthday. Now, I'm quite busy, and we know everything is on lockdown, and I said, you know what, I want to make this thing special for this child. And I said, we wouldn't always do it right because I went and I bought a cake at local supermarket. And my wonderful, darling wife told me from the time I reached home with the cake, this has pink flowers on it. <laughs> I used to you know flowers and what color it is. Then further investigation show that it was not, didn't only have pink flowers, she told me it was eggless. No problem in that. What I want to say is we may not have it right always, but we should show that purpose in wanting to have a relationship. Let me finish out the next couple of verses from Ecclesiastes. Chapter number 4, verses 8, 7 and 8. The Bible says, Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. And I hope you remember the illustration that I gave. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. I want you to reflect on the illustration that I just gave. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too, the preacher is saying, is meaningless, a miserable business. It might be worth your while to remember that what shall it profit a man if he shall gain this whole world but lose his own soul? It might do you well to remember that the scripture tells us and Jesus says, do not lay up treasures on earth but in heaven. And I am around to tell you that, yes, we have a lot of fathers who are not taking time to have a relationship with their children, but they should manage their time, and they should do it for the honor and glory of God. Let me move then to my third and final point on this Father's Day, and I trust that you're enjoying this message, and it is an important one. So the third area that we want to talk about now is responsibility. Responsibility. And the father has a responsibility to provide and to protect. He is provider. You see, God provided for Adam. But Adam, in the Garden of Eden, was responsible to provide for his family. And he did that through work. He was supposed to tend to the garden. So I am telling you fathers, your primary primary responsibility is to provide, but also to protect. There are fathers who leave home, they don't care about their family, their children, and you have a responsibility to protect your family, your children, your wife. You see, God put Adam in the garden and he says, guard the garden, and I will guard you while I guard the garden. God was his protector. And so, I want you to remember that, my dear friends. You cannot leave your children. You cannot leave your family. 
and just do your own thing. You should be a responsible man. And by being that, what you are saying, I am taking my position, and I want you to remember that word, position as a father seriously. You know, we have to bring this message to a close, but I have some information that I will give you that will make this message very practical and relevant. Having said all that I just said, the father has an extremely important part in the family. And the devil would like nothing more than if it's one person in the family you should remove, is the head, and that's the father. He did it, or he tried to do it with Moses when Pharaoh was like a madman killing children and throwing them into the, um, the, the, the Nile River for the crocodile, crocodiles to eat them. It happened at the birth of Jesus when King Herod heard that there was another king coming on the scene. And he couldn't stand the fact that there'll be another king. So he went on a rampage to kill all children two years and under. You know the story. If the devil could get to the head, come on. And he can take away the father from the home, the father figure from the home, he would have won. And let me tell you what is sadly happening today. We have a lot of homes in disarray. I already told you about the workaholics. But I also want to tell you that there are a lot of fathers who are alcoholics. In other words, they love the rum and the lime more than taking care of their family. You know what I'm talking about, right? So you have the workaholics, you have the alcoholics, you have the womanizers. You have these fathers who have no time or little time with their family, but they have time for other female companions. So my dear friends, we have the fathers who are alcoholics. They love rum till they die more than their family. You have the workaholics. You have the womanizers. You have the ones who are killing one another. But permit me, in the limited time I have, to share with you about the liberal, seeker-sensitive church, where we are now embracing in the church the LBGTQ uh, movement. And they are coming into the church and we are accepting them under the banner of love and grace. Now, let me make something very, very clear. These people have to be loved. They are human beings who, in my mind, are committing sins, sexual sins, just as the um, woman who wants to live common law relationship, and they are living in sin. So it's a sin, all the same. It's a sexual sin. So the way some churches and some pastors, and I, that is not my intention here today, would pass judgment on them as if they should be thrown away even before given a chance. That is not my intention. But here's the problem that I have. Because we are calling them progressive Christians, what tend to happen is we want to embrace them, and I'm saying that we should. But my dear friends, not at the expense of these people pushing or having their rights, at the expense of now going into your homes and redefining marriage. My Bible tells me marriage is one man with one woman. Case closed. But what we have today that is taking the fathers away, and I'm going to get to that point in a very, very clear way in a short, in a short bit, is what we're going to call transgenderism. Transgenderism. And let me give you 
what that means. It refers to a broad spectrum of people who persistently identify with a gender different from their natal sex. Now, where did this all start? Well, you had the transvestite that was the term given, I think, very early 1904 or thereabout by a German sexologist who said, I am not happy with my makeup. So you know what? I am going to change my sex organs. I am medically going to say, although I was born a man, I want to be a woman. Could you imagine that? The Bible tells us that God has made us, fearfully and wonderfully made us. And here is a man today who is saying that I don't want to be a man anymore. I want to be a woman. No, and then you want to tell me that we should be so loving and caring that we have to ignore what God says and embrace them? Let me tell you something. And fathers, you may have some tendencies but I am telling you, this is not uh, something you have by birth. This is alert behavior. And God wants you, you just have to look at the Bible, Romans chapter 1. The Bible says it is wrong to leave and to have unnatural affection for the same sex. So what am I saying and what does that have to do with Father's Day? It has everything to do with that. Because... We talk about the transvestite, so he now dresses as a, a woman. He puts on makeup, he takes a handbag, he wears a dress, he grows long hair. If he's bald head, he might wear a wig. And so he's a, he's a man, but he's saying, I am a woman. And then they move from transvestite to transsexual. Because it is now a gender expression that differs from the sex that they were assigned at birth. And let me tell you what these people are thinking about. They are saying things like, we have womanness, we have manness, we have two spirits, we have um, gender queer, and all these things are different genders. When my Bible tells me that there is only male and female. But pastor, what do I have to do with Father's Day? Well, if these people continue to push and have their rights, and we sit down and do nothing about it, as individuals, as a society, as a church, and we say that is okay, then in the next generation, we will lose our fathers. Because let me tell you something, it's getting bad, eh? You know, 15 years ago, a survey was done. Listen to me very carefully. A survey was done. And when they asked and they did the survey, it was in one of the questions, the answer was that 60% of the people surveyed were opposed to a same-sex relationship. The same survey was done a couple of years ago, of course, with different demographics and... and, and, and and personnel and so on. But the idea was the same. And what came up, instead of 60, it had been reduced to 40. In other words, the lifestyle today is more accommodating to having same-sex marriage. And you're telling me, a father who is supposed to now take his responsibility in the home, don't know if he's a man or if he's a woman. You could tell me what madness has taken place on the face of the earth today. And you know, I was hearing Imbert, um, our Minister of Finance, talking about the problem with NIS. And you know, in 25 years, there, there's going to be a depletion of the funds. And one of the reasons is that you have less working people. And not only you have less working people, but, you know, what you have now is young people 
don't want to get married. In other words, when I was 25, I got married, mid-20s. Today you have children 30, 40 years not getting married. I don't have the answer to that and I really don't know why. Probably they engulf in their career and so on and so forth. But getting to the point, what Embert was saying, in a few years' time, you would have less workforce. And if I could use that same idea to tell you that there's coming a time when right now we have less people getting married, coupled with that you have the LBGT movement where you have more fathers moving in a different direction. They're not moving straight at all. They're not sure when they look at their genitalia if they are a man or a woman, and if they recognize that they are a man, they say, well, I want to be a woman. We are moving from one state to the next. And so from transsexual now, which was about 1949, the term was coined, we now move to transgender, where the British are calling them trans. My dear friends, what is going to happen when fathers come out of the scene? Well, when fathers are physically removed from the home by whatever means, and I have given you a list already, studies have shown that when there is no father in the home, it is likely that five times more children will drop out from school. 20 times they will end up in prison and they are more likely to have behavioral problems. They move away from home and they start their own lifestyle all because fathers are not taking responsibility to take their position seriously. So my dear friends, this is Father's Day. What did I say today? I talk about respect in the home, on both sides. Children obey, fathers do not exasperate. I talk about relationship and that you should spend and manage your time wisely in order to have your children grow in the way of God and show that you care for them. You know, there was a, 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 a father who just bought his, a car for his, his son and he felt proud about it, but never took time, never took time to uh, spend time with that child. So as a teenager, the child took the new brand car and went to Lyme. Drank his belly full with alcohol, and then coming back home, he crashed the car. When he crashed the car, the news got to the father, and the father rushed to the hospital. And you would think that a caring father who has relationship would rush to the bedside of his young son. But he stopped by the police, and the first question that he asked the officer who did the reporting and investigation and so on, was, is my car all right? And here you have fathers who are more concerned about their stuff, their material things, than their family. So I am saying respect, relationship, but responsibility. As I close, I want to ask you, what kind of father are you? Are you one who is going to take your role seriously and as such have connection with the others, other members of the family? I trust that you would. Let me pray for you as father and dads. We love you. We care for you. This is why we are preaching what we are preaching here today. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we are thanking you so much for this wonderful time that we had around your word. And we are thanking you that we could open the scriptures and share from it what you want us to know about our roles as fathers. And a beautiful example was shared with you and your father, Jesus. 
And so we thank you today that as we share these truths, that, Lord, you will touch every father. Lord, minister to each home and each family that this message is going forth. That, Lord, we will be responsible. We will have relationship. Lord, we will have a, a respect one for another. And, Lord, we will, we will, we will have homes that are bringing honor and glory to you. Thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray for every father that you will touch their lives and minister to their deepest needs. Bless every home, O oh God, and may everyone understand the pivotal role a father has to play. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, one of the things that we are doing weekly is also praying for tithes and offering. So let's pause for that right now. Thank you, Lord, for your gifts. Thank you, Lord, for what you have blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, for giving us an income that we can tithe from it. And so I thank you for the tithes and offering that will have come in. I pray that you will bless it and multiply it and continue, oh God, to use it for the, 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 the furtherance of your gospel and that your work will prosper and many souls and many fathers will be rich in the name of Jesus we give you praise and thanks. Amen and amen. So folks, I trust that you enjoyed our time around the word today. Um, I gave you what I thought was a very practical and relevant message that you should take seriously. Don't just look at this message or hear it and say, well, I will continue. If God is speaking to you and you can apply some of these truths, you will be a good father a better father, probably the best father. Have a great day in the Lord. And the next time, we are going to continue on the Lord's Prayer. God bless you, and have a good day in the Lord. Happy Father's Day. You are alpha.